I'm not joking. Like I, I've approached the reserves of the National Guard, and they're like, eh, "Sorry." You know, the, I, one guy just looked at me. He's like, "How old are you?" <laughs> That's all good. Okay, so uh, Daryl Baskin here again. Okay, so this is retinal imaging and exam. I threw an examination because we've got a little bit of exam stuff here. Mostly it's imaging. Uh, so I don't have any relevant financial interest to disclose since I have no job. All right. Uh, primary source material, again, is the BCSC. I took some stuff from optics, which is, as you can imagine, not my forte, but I thought, man, you don't get optics much during the year, right? Might as well throw in a little bit of retina doctor doing optics. That's got to be unusual. So, so here we go. Direct ophthalmoscopy, something I have not done in like over a decade. Uh, I'm sure some of you at least have one accessible and, and use it on your neuro rotations and other rotations. So the field of view is very small, as we all know. In fact, if all that existed for ophthalmology is direct, I don't think I would have become an ophthalmologist. I fell in love with ophthalmology when I did my first indirect exam. Actually, there was a third-year resident uh, who was holding up a 90 diopter lens or 78 as at the VA, and she said, hey, do you want to see the retina? I was like, sure. I've been sitting in this back corner doing nothing. So she holds it up. This old vet didn't care, of course. And so like, I kind of tuck in and look through the slit lamp, and it was amazing. You know, the first time you see it, it's like, at least for me, I'll never forget that. I don't remember if the patient even had any disease or pathology, but it was awesome. It was not a direct exam. A direct ophthalmoscopy exam, I, I tried many times to get that. I don't think I ever got it right until I was a resident. Certainly as a med student, I didn't enjoy it. And also you get so close to the patient, like, what about breath? I mean, what about, anyway. So seven degree field of view and versus indirect, which is much bigger, right? 25 degrees or larger or smaller, depending on which lens you're using. In this case, we got a 20 diopter lens. And why is it so different? It's because these rays that exit the patient's eye don't get refracted again to go back into the examiner's eye. Whereas here, we're bending them back to get in. So if you look at that green ray at the bottom, it's looking like it's at the optic nerve, but it's further away from center. It gets bent again. So that's, that's the key reason there. So when you talk about magnification, you have a lot more magnification with direct, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody remember the simple magnification uh, calculation? It's it, for direct, isn't it like 15 times? Or something? It is, you're right. So it actually is 15 x. So there's a calculation that you used to get there. It's divide by four. four, right? So you take your dioptric power, divide by four, assuming you're not like 30 yards away, right? You know, you're this whatever regular 25 centimeter distance or something. So you take 60 because you're using the patient's ocular. Uh, and obviously, if they're aphakic, it's going to be different, right? Uh, and with a high myope, sometimes you can actually get a view just looking across the room. Oh, you know, I see your retina. I don't have anything here. So um, indirect is different, and it's a little bit more complex. And I've quizzed you guys so much, I don't want to torture you on this. So transverse magnification, the way you figure out, like, so that's how tall the little figure is going to be, this aerial image is you're, you basically use similar triangles. So you have to figure out the focal lengths of each lens. So with a 60 diopter lens, does anybody remember how you figure out, get the focal length from the power? One by exactly, David. Yep, so exactly. So one over F equals P or vice versa, F equals one over P. So basically we can form these little triangles which are not, uh, they're not proportionate, by the way, because the one on the left looks a lot bigger or longer than the one on the right, and that's not the case. So if you take uh, if you take 1 over 60, you get, in, in, or 100 over 60, 100 centimeters over 60, you get 1.67 centimeters. Take 100 centimeters divided by 20, you get 5 centimeters. So now you have two proportional triangles. So then to figure out how tall that little figure on the retina is, you can't see my, oh, you can kind of see my slow cursor there. If you want to correlate that to here, you basically just divide 5 by 1.67. So this figure, this aerial image on the right is going to be three times larger than the image that's on the patient's retina, right? So, or not the image on the retina, like the optic nerve or whatever it is you're looking on the retina itself. So it's an, I don't know if you guys remember, again, going back to my first time ever getting an indirect. So when I first used an indirect or first actually successfully used it, I think I was doing an ROP exam or something. I was on a pediatric ophthalmology rotation, David Coates at uh, Baylor, and I remember thinking that the picture was hovering in front of the lens. And I said that to maybe the resident was there and they're like, that's crazy. But that's actually what's going on. You actually are getting an image that's actually several centimeters in front of the lens. It's aerial, it's inverted and all that stuff, but, but it's sitting there hovering. 
And so it's three times larger, but that's only if you're at a 25 centimeter distance. If you're actually at 40 centimeters distance, which is probably more of the normal arm length, uh, you're going to have less. So you, you go down to 1.87 times, so it's even less magnification than the 15x of direct. But you do get axial magnification, right? So that's your depth perception, and that's related to the square, the transverse magnification. So it would be 9x, but then remember with your indirects, you've got these little guys, these little periscopes that move your ocular picture, whatever, viewing close to the center. It goes down to 15 millimeters from 60 on average or 70 or whatever. So then you actually have to reduce your axial magnification from 9x divided by 4, you get 2.25x. I think that's all the optics we have. You guys all made it through it. Uh, there's some basic optics when we're looking at some of these different um, imaging modalities. So scanning laser ophthalmoscope, can you guys name a, 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 pic, a camera that you have right now? It's an SLO. You guys probably have one. What do you guys take pictures of patients with? Not OCT, but... Optus. So Optus is an SLO. So there you go. So we, they, we use a laser to illuminate the fundus, certain wavelength. We move a mirror rapidly to move that around like a raster pattern, right? So we're just like... Picture, or pixel, 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 like that. And we use these pinholes to basically exclude all the scattered stuff. But it's confocal, meaning we're only getting information from one plane. So if you have, for instance, a retinal detachment, that retina is way out in front, it's going to be out of focus or it's going to be dark or green or something like that. So here's a, an example of a patient I operated on a number of years ago. Note how green it is. This is Optos TX. Um, I mentioned that TX because that's key, because the book actually lists off two different wavelengths. I don't know if you need to memorize these. I don't think so. That the, that the original Optus TX uh, SLO used, and it used a 532 and a 633. And it took the red laser and the green laser and then created this pseudocolor image, and we got tons of green stuff like that. Nowadays, no, I say nowadays, people have an Optus California. I don't know why California is supposed to be better than Texas, but anyway, so this is what they had. This is outdated. California has three different lasers. It's got a 532, now it says 635. I don't know why they changed it. And then a 488, more of a blue. And it uses those three to create a better color picture um, than this. So I just, but I want to contrast this because this patient also, I took photos with an Aiden, or they like you to say Aiden, but. EI for me is I. So Iden camera, do you guys have that camera in any of your clinics? It's nice, it's not awesome. It does not visualize Nevi at all, or very, very poorly. So if you ever have a Nevis and you take a picture of it, you won't see it. Um, but it is great for epiretinal membranes. If you're trying to talk a patient into surgery, get, a, get an Iden photo or um, like a composite image from uh, the Heidelberg spectralis. If you have that capability, those false color images will show ERMs really well too. Not that you should ever try to talk a patient into ERM surgery. I got a whole talk about that. <laughs> it's not, you're too busy like saving the world with RDs and TRDs and stuff. Okay. Uh, so, so the difference between these two, they're both confocal scanning laser ophthalmoscopes, but the, the one on the left, the iodine uses a, a white LED and a near infrared. So they're getting, they're not having to re basically Photoshop their pictures as much. And this isn't really a fair comparison. Does anybody know what this is, this little pink box? What am I circling there or boxing? You guys aren't retina surgeons. So this is a residual gas bubble. So I just operated on this guy. So he had an RD because he had a staphyloma. He had a staphyloma-related macular hole. Macular hole got a lot worse with the staphyloma. He actually had, had a macular hole for a while, had no RD, was happy. I found an old picture before I joined the practice. And we were just tracking him. Super high myope. Real nice guy. And uh, then he developed an RD, and he started noticing visual loss peripherally. So I was like, well, okay, we gotta, we got to fix this. He's like, well, i got no central vision. I don't care about that. I was like, well, good, because I might have to laser your macular hole down, which I never had to do before. And sure enough, he had no break in his retina except his macular hole. So I slurped all the subretinal fluid through the macular hole, which is, ooh, it's a bad feeling as a retina doctor. <laughs> and then I lasered his macula. See all that? I mean, I just, you feel terrible, but I just put gas in, not oil. And he was doing great up until the last time I saw him, which was, again, probably a year or two ago. So he's very happy. I'm very happy. I got a great picture. So all is well. Wish I could save his phobia. Not a fair comparison because the first photo has an RD, and both of these imaging modalities are not good at RDs, although Optus is better now. You can't even tell where the RD is in this Optus picture. Okay, adaptive op optics, very cool, not FDA approved yet. If you guys, I've never gotten to use one of these. I've seen lots of pictures. Basically, what they do is they use wavefront aberrometry. So you can see these lens splitters. Basically, they measure all the distortions your cornea and your tear film and your lens are causing. 
measure with a wavefront, uh, whatever, Hartman shack, something or other, aberrometer. And then it sends that information to this flexible mirror, and the mirror has these little actuators, and the mirror changes the way, the way that the light, after the, once the light hits it, it tries to correct for your aberrations. And so this is originally like a Hubble type thing, like an astronomical type telescope technology. And then we use it for eyes, again, not FDA approved. And what's cool is you can actually count photoreceptors. So I, I used to tell my patients like, hey, someday we're gonna have this awesome machine and you're gonna come in, I'm gonna tell you, well, it's gonna be a little bit sad because every time you come in, you have a smaller number of <laughs> photoreceptors but we'll actually be able to measure what's going on at a much more granular level. But we can't do that yet. I did read like a couple years ago, somebody came out with a commercially viable machine. These things like fill up a room. I think there's a lot, much smaller version like VCR size. You guys know what VCR is? <laughs> like three or four <laughs> laptops put together. Okay. So I want to talk about OCT, but I feel obligated to try to explain OCT. And I do have to say, you don't have to know how it works to be able to interpret the images, <laughs> right? So if you don't remember any of this, don't worry about it. But it is really awesome stuff, and it's amazing technology. It didn't exist at this level when I was a resident. Literally, we had time domain OCT. Nobody knew what to do with it. Spectral domain came out like my senior year came out. Like We started hearing about it. And I had an attending who's a good friend of mine. He's like, I don't see any need to ever buy a spectral domain OCT. I can see everything I need with time domain. That is, I mean, he would never say that now. And he probably doesn't remember saying that at the time. Anyway, spectral domain OCT changed everything. I mean, you guys understand retina now because of spectral domain OCT. So, but to understand how they got the technology there, I'm starting out with anti-reflective coating on glasses. So my glasses and your glasses and maybe your glasses all have anti-reflective coating. I think yours do, Michelle. And so, I mean, the fact that I could see your eyes means you probably do, right? Because if you don't have it on, whenever you look at somebody, it's just like, you know, white stuff right here, all the lights shining back off. So the way that works is you apply this film, that little gray membrane thing on there, and what it does is the thickness is specific to the wavelength you want to block. So you'll make the thickness about a quarter wavelength thick, and what happens is, is when light, some, you want it so that it only blocks like some percentage of the light. We'll say 50% compared to what the front surface. So the back surface blocks 50%, the front surface blocks 50%. This is not 100%, otherwise no light would get inside your eyes, right? So it's just a, it basically, the, the way I understand it is, if you can measure how much light is reflecting off of regular glasses, which let's say that's 1% of all the light that comes in, then you want to reflect, you basically want to create a film barrier that is gonna also reflect 1% back off the front surface. So you have 1% reflecting off the glass, 1% off of the film, and they're a quarter wavelength and distance apart, which means that some of that light that goes all the way to the glasses travels two quarter wavelengths longer than the stuff that bounces off the front. So some bounces off here, and then some other, the other half goes one quarter in, one quarter out, and then it comes out a half wavelength different. So it's destructive interference, right? We all remember this from like physics or something. So, all right, I just said all that stuff. Okay, military can now see the hand gestures, explanation. So you get destructive interference. You have a, you basically have zero intensity. Your, your composite wave is gonna be zero. Okay, so now we're gonna take that, that idea and just extrapolate it a little bit. So now we have a light source. I think I have an, ah, oh yes, I did do this last night. Okay, good. So you basically have a beam splitter, which does exactly what it says. So some of the light on the orange goes up and hit, hits mirror one. We're gonna call that distance ZR. And then the other half will say 50%, or that is 50%. So 50% goes and hits mirror two, which is ZS. And if those mirrors are exactly the same distance from the beam splitter, you're gonna have constructive interference, right? You're gonna get that same amount of light that hits the detector that emitted from the light source, assuming you didn't lose anything. So you have these two waves, they're in phase, right? Constructive interference. Now, if we picture, remember that, uh, we, that wavelength of, sorry, the film from the last slide that was a quarter wavelength thick. So if we move mirror one out just a little bit, a quarter wavelength, now the light that hits that detector is gonna be completely out of phase, one half wavelength off, and you're gonna have destructive interference, you have a, just a flat line, right? If you moved it just a little bit, you're gonna, let's say a third of a, a wavelength, then you're gonna get the stuff that's just a little bit out of phase. Okay, that's basically the whole concept of interferometry. Um, there's this thing called a Michelson interferometer, which is what OCT is based off of. You can look at videos online like I did. It's kind of interesting. So basically, that's what goes into time domain OCT, which you guys don't use anymore. I don't use anymore. I, I used it in Africa when I lived there, and it wasn't fun, but it works. And now that we know spectral domain, we're actually, we can do a lot better with time domain, but that's a different story. So time domain is essentially what we just did with the last picture. 
is that top mirror, the movable mirror, is, like it says, movable. And let's say this is actually an old, they got rid of this picture. It's not in the book. If you have a 2021 BCSC, maybe you do, mm -hmm. then you'll see this picture. The 2023 does not have it. The 2023 has mostly better pictures, but this one was good. So if you picture, we move that mirror, and we're basically moving it until we get constructive interference. It tells us that there's something going on in the retina on the sample side. And when we see that constructive interference, we know, OK, hey, we're getting reflections back. If you get nothing back, if there's nothing reflecting, you're going to get your, you're not going to get destructive interference. You're just going to have a really low original waveform that went to the reference side. Kind of makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, it's OK. You'll still get OCTs. So this is it. This is from the newer BCSC. So again, we've got uh, actually some messed up arrows here. Again, I hate to correct the book, but they got it wrong. So we, again, we had the light going out. I don't know if I have an animation coming on this one or not. Nope, didn't. All right, we'll go back. Um, so basically, if you look at the upper right, we have ZS1, ZS2, ZS3. These are basically spaces. This is like tr ground truth retina. This is where the, the RPE is, the ellipsoid zone, the ILM, something like that, something that's giving you some bright spikes. And then you get these little signals showing up that you see down in this middle, the raw A-scan data. And then it transforms that into uh, basically signal intensities for hyperreflectivity. So Fourier domain came out. Same thing as spectral domain. Same thing as like frequency domain, something like that. They've got like three different names. And then we've got two broad categories, swept source, which I've never gotten to use. Do you guys have a swept source OCT? They're, they, they are commercially available. There's a really cool one called the Plex that, Cirrus, that Zeiss makes. I don't usually like Zeiss, but their Plex looks awesome, Plex 9000 or something like that. Um, it's like a Y2K name, but it, uh, it's only research available. Uh, it, you know, so, but it's very awesome. You'll see some amazing pictures. Uh, but there are some uh, non-Heidelberg, non-Cirrus commercially available swept source OCT. If you go to like vendors at AAO, you'll see them. And, and they have great images. So. I think all you need to know about is what I'm going to show you on this slide. So it has a tunable laser as its light source. So it go, tunable laser means it's, the reason it's called swept source is it's sweeping through a bunch of, of uh, frequencies or wavelengths. So it's going Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. And it's doing that for every single point. And it basically gets information a little bit differently than, spectral, than our classic spectral domain OCT does. It's a faster image acquisition, wider scanning ranges, better imaging of the vitreous and the choroid. That's the main advantage. And a little bit better penetration through opacities. Spectral domain or spectrometer-based domain OCT uses a super luminescent diode. It's actually a little bit wider wavelength. I'll show you. It's like a little bit broader band. It's not just like red or not just green. It's like kind of, I, I'm not actually sure what the typical range is, but we'll say like 450 to 650, something like that. Um, and the advantages are it's a lot cheaper and uh, it has bad, better axial resolution. So this is a busy slide. What I'm showing you in the bottom left is that broader band light source. Basically, this is the reason why we can do this Fourier transformation is that we basically, if you look at the very beginning, we have a blue, green, and a red wavelength. And at the very beginning, they're all kind of in phase. But as you go on in time, they become more and more out of phase. That creates that that basically gives it a sense of depth and how far it's traveled. So basically, you no longer have to move a mirror. So that's the main difference. Time domain, you have to move a mirror, so it takes time. On spectral domain, we don't have to move the mirror. We have a fixed reference mirror, and it doesn't take very much time. The acquisition is super fast. So we'll move on to what you need to know. Oh, again, they got the errors wrong. And then so here's the raw A-scan data that comes out. You flip that 90 degrees. Ooh, it's a slow. I'm glad I don't have a lot of those. <clears throat> Uh, at transitions. So you get the raw A-scan data like this. Then you form something called a longitudinal reflectivity profile. And on the left, I wrote hyperreflective. On the right, hyperreflective. So now we're getting closer to what we're used to seeing. You could assign numbers to that if you want. And then that translates into, if it's far to the right, you assign bright signal. If it's far to the left, you assign black. When I was doing this, we did colors. We all got rid of colors because that was stupid. Um, so, so this is kind of what we're all used to seeing. That's how we got there. There's a few key things you need to know, not many. So this is a slide that's from the OCT group in OCT, like the, basically a standardization of nomenclature. It's been out for a few years now. I'm highlighting in blue uh, these three. Can somebody admit Jonathan Malmrose? Does anybody have that ability? Just so you can see this. Or deny, I mean, if it's a bad person. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, sure. All right, just let anybody in. So. What, what we've got here is we, I, you have the three nuclear layers that are in blue. Those are all darker layers on the OCT. 
And then this next three are pretty key. These are all hyper-reflective on OCT or brighter than normal. So external limiting membrane, ellipsoid zone, RPE Brooks. That's three. Sometimes we talk about four bright lines on the outer portion. Sorry, I don't have a laser pointer kind of point here. Interdigitation zone is not always visible. I'm slowly getting my cursor over here. Um, ah. So some people I could see it in, some people I can't. If I see a change in the same person, that might be meaningful. When you look at things like autoimmune retinopathy, you can start to see some differences in the photoreceptor, photoreceptor outer segment links. AIR is such a tough disease. Okay, so OCT angiography. Basically, do you guys know how this works? I mean, I'm still going to tell you, even if you do know. So basically, um, we take five or six scans in quick succession, at least on the Cirrus we do. I don't know how many Heidelberg takes. And then what we do with those B scans is we look for any modulation in the signal intensity. So think of like when you're looking at the sky at night and you see like, you know, different lights. You see like one that's not blinking, one that's blinking green, one that's blinking red. And then a satellite typically is going to give you kind of a, a fairly um, constant light signal. But if you look at a star far away, you kind of see it twinkle, right? So what we're looking for is a twinkling in the signal because things that are moving, like red blood cells, are going to be here for one scan, okay, give a bright reflection back. On the next scan, there will be nothing, and now all of a sudden it looks dark. So it's bright, dark, bright, dark. So whenever it sees changes, it assigns an intensity to that change. Everything else gets blacked out. If it's not, in other words, if it's moving, it's bright. If it's not moving, it's dark. So I think that's what that paragraph says. We usually look at them on FOSS. It's, that's just what we're used to. You can look at them as B scans, and I have before. Uh, and actually, yeah. So, but I usually use slabs. So I'll assign a certain depth and, uh, and a total um, height of that slab, and then I'll look across. And it can be a little bit challenging depending on the software program you have to actually find what you're looking for. I principally use OCTA and myopic CNV because uh, it, they, I'll, I'll, I, don't, I just don't like doing FAs all the time on them. Uh, and honestly, on the regular OCT, you don't always see fluid, but you might actually see a subtle uh, CNV on, on uh, a myopic CNV on OCTA. And then if I have a patient with AMD and I'm, or if they've got a patelliform lesion and I'm not sure if they have leakage or active CNV, I'll do an OCTA. It can be a little dicey. I don't treat every CMV that I see on OCTA. If there's no fluid, I typically, I don't really want to go down my algorithm for treatment right now, but um, in general, there are, are some patients that have active CMV on OCTA that have no symptoms, that have no decompensation of their retina, and they're very happy. I would not give them a shot. Um, but that's for a further discussion. Just so you know, just because you see CNV on OCTA does not mean treat, treat, treat. Okay. Are, yeah, go ahead. Are a lot of fiber groups using OCTA right now? They, it does not have its own separate paying code. Right. So the groups that use it the most are the ones that are probably more scientifically curious but don't care about the money as much. Um, we used it a ton. Uh, my uh, senior partner, Cal, was a big fan of, you know, practicing medicine the way you want to practice it and then do what's best for the patient. Don't worry about the money. And I love that. And so we got all the best equipment. And um, yeah, so I'd say, gosh, I don't remember. I'm in the DRCR uh, group, and we do a lot of OCTA studies. I want to say a third to a half of all of our investigators have OCTA. It might be more than that now. Um, and we obviously are, it's, it's a biased sampling because they're all research-oriented groups, right? But a lot of private practices do have it. Um, it's it does cost money to add it on to an existing machine, and some machines are not upgradable. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's I forgot it's fifteen twenty thousand something like that. And you'll it's, it'll never pay for itself, right? right? And and you do fewer FAs, so you make even less money. But I find it to be really useful. Okay. Um, but again, really useful when I need it, and I don't need it very often. I would say I was doing <clears throat> quote unquote needing OCTA maybe one day a week, maybe two days a week, okay. one or two times each time. Uh, so unlike FA, which can visualize a superficial vascular plexus, OCTA also can look at something called the radial peripapillary capillary network and the deep vascular plexus. Three big artifacts, the book went into this, so I'm listing them, motion artifact, projection artifact, and signal voids. Projection artifact means that basically if you have a blood vessel traveling, it's obviously, go, it's, it's the blood, those red blood cells are saying, here's the signal, no signal, here's the signal, no signal. 
Well, what's happening is, is when you're looking at a deeper slab, a deep, deeper portion of the same tissue, that same tissue is kind of blinking the same way because the light's hitting it, the light's not hitting it. So it can sometimes make it look like there's another blood vessel deeper when there's not. And you'll see that if you look at enough OCTAs. Signal voids are basically like you get these ungradable areas. You look at this dark area and like, is that truly not having any blood flow? It kind of looks funny to me. And we see it a lot at the DRCR when we do OCTA studies. The reading centers that we contract with will often, I forgot what the rate is of, of rejection, but the quality is not often good enough. They reject quite a few OCTAs, signal voids. Okay, my checklist for looking at OCTs, make sure you have the right person, right? That may or may not be an issue where you are. Some EHRs don't allow you to look at other people's OCTs at the same time, some do, just be careful. Signal strength index is not as big of a deal anymore. This is more of an issue 10, 15 years ago. Um, some some uh, machines do multiple B-scan uh, averaging. Heidelberg is great at that. Cirrus does like five or six. It's just kind of so-so. Look at all the scans you have. You'd be surprised. And, and fellow um, I, I'm not sure if there's a person alive that's been in practice for more than 10 years that hasn't missed something. And um, I, we, you try really hard not to miss stuff. Um, and... I mean, I've, I've seen so many artifacts. I'll just say this one. Sometimes uh, the wrong eyes will be, the eye laterality will be misassigned, and sometimes you will give or not give an injection incorrectly because of that. So just be careful. If it's really a big departure, you know, be thinking. If you're really busy in clinic, that's where you're more likely to make a mistake. Um, so I look at it from top to bottom, anterior to posterior. Uh, I look at thickness maps, if, if we have them, and then decide if the segmentation lines are appropriately drawn. If they're not drawn right, then you also get artifacts with that. Uh, I wanted to throw in some more examples of that, I don't think I did. Um, and then, then I'm looking at the vitreous. Is it a partial PVD? Is it vitreous macular adhesion? Is there a PVD? Are you unable to comment on PVD status? Looking at the contour, is it a normal foveolar contour, or foveal contour? How is it abnormal? Retinal thickness, is it too thick? Is it too thin? Which layers are too thick or too thin? And then try to find normal retina and then trace into areas of pathology. Because sometimes you look at something and you're like, I don't know where to start. I don't see anything that looks normal. And sometimes there's not anything that's normal. Are there any abnormal hyporeflective, that means darker or hyperreflective, brighter signals within the neurosensory retina? Uh, cystoid spaces, exudates, hyperreflective foci, hemorrhage. Can't always say whether it's hemorrhage or not. In fact, OCT is not great at really delineating hemorrhage especially if it's small. RPE hyperplasia, which is hyperreflective into the neurosensory retina. Look for external limiting membrane and ellipsoid zone disruptions, we used to call it ISOS. Uh, RPE regularities, SHRIM, that's the subretinal hyperreflective material. And then look for choroidal shadowing. This, this is probably what I'm most likely to miss. Hypertransmission defects, not so much. Um, look at choroidal thickness. So we'll start out with a few. Yeah, doing okay. We're, I saved FA for the very end. I don't think we'll get to it. We covered FA in July. Some of us did. Sorry, military. Uh, so something wrong with the foveal contour. All right. All right. Well, let's see if you guys want to. And then my little asterisk means it could be pathognomonic. Okay. We'll just go this way. Saxon, uh, just kind of describe what you want. Keep it brief. Sure. Um, so here we have some sort of a membrane. Yep. Uh, Mm -hmm. um, Perfect. That's all you need to say. Yeah. Do you want to give a diagnosis? Uh, I would like a, a bad ERM here. ERM, VMT. You got it. So, yeah, really, I've not seen too many VMT cases with that kind of fluid. But there's also some peripapillary stuff going on there. At, so, all right. Oh, you get an easy one, Taylor. What do we have here? Uh, this is full thickness macular. Yep. Any other comments you want to make on what you see? Yeah, so you, right, so this is a vertical slice on purpose. I can't remember why I chose vertical over horizontal. I imagine that the gel is still attached to the nerve, almost always is, but you're right, that it's not attached at the fovea, right? So there's no VMT on the smacular hole. Nobody would ever want to do a PVL in pneumatic vitreolysis. I, the, I don't do PVLs in general anymore because of <clears throat> complication rates. So yes, so this is a, a macular hole, and I'm showing the next few slides because I think it's really, this is what I use in clinical practice every single day. I get tons of OCTs. I don't care if they get paid for or not. I, I just want to do the best for the patient, and I'm also intellectually curious, right? So here you can see that you have lost ellipsoid zone right in the center, right? Uh, and you can trace from normal coming into the, from the sides and see where it's, where it's working, where it's not. 
What I do point out to the patients is that their ELM is still intact. What we think, I say we, me and maybe other retina doctors, maybe not, is that if you see the ELM, that probably that photoreceptors that, that contribute to that are still alive. If you don't see ELM, there's a, there's a decent chance that they're dead. So if I see ELM, I'm hopeful. Um, and then, so that was eight days after surgery. This is a month after. You can't really see as much now. There's, in terms of ELM, like the ELM, the ellipsoid zone, you just see just kind of this weird middling reflectivity in the center. But then here, six months out, you do see them going across. So we see resumption of the ellipsoid zone. We see um, ELM. And it's not perfect. It's kind of chunky. There's like, it's like gap tooth, but that's fine. That's a very typical healing pro uh, process. You can see a little ERM forming as well on the surface. It's not causing too much of a problem at this point. Um, and the other thing that I will point out to patients, again, I probably tell patients more than they want to know, battery layers the, the ellipsoid zone, right? So we're waiting for your cell phone to come back to life. We're waiting for those batteries to recharge or reform, whatever. But the mitochondria are so cool. There's this really interesting paper that showed that I might have mentioned this last time, that when light comes into the eye, the mitochondria act as micro lenses that focus the light onto the photoreceptors. So you get even, those mitochondria aren't just batteries, they're helping you with your visual acuity. So as they come on, you get better vision. This patient had 20, 20, this is a year after surgery. What uh, was he the month at? Was he still, like, because the ellipsoid zone wasn't, because isn't there I don't remember the visual acuity. Yeah, no. Because they look good on OCT, you're like, oh, I closed it, but their vision The is closure open. is important, yeah. but right. The visual acuity comes down to the ellipsoid zone. Mm -hmm. So if you don't see ellipsoid zone, they almost never see that well. Solar retinopathy is a bit of an, uh, of an exception to that rule. If we get to that case, I'll show you that one. Okay. They can oftentimes have more photoreceptor loss. Than, than you would expect in terms of their vision, and their vision's still quite good. So um, this is another, oh, sorry, uh, Michelle, what is this? Or what do you see, either one? Um, so it looks like thickening of the yes. maybe some cystic changes. Mm -hmm. Cystic changes, I'm just, I'm just repeating you so the military people can hear. Uh, is, is that an ERM? You got it, ERM. <clears throat> and this patient did not have surgery, but like a little bit long, later, they had a partial peel spontaneously. And this does happen. And you could still see gel there. So that gel kind of contracted maybe a little bit. There's still gel right up against the retinal surface and the temporal macula. It's still not a great outcome, but better. This is not my patient. This is a friend of mine in fellowship. Uh, something not right in the inner retina. This is the category we're going to. And it's Lily. Yes. OK. All right, Lily, you're up. You are right. Something is not right. <clears throat> where is it more right? On the right side or the left side? Where, where does it look more normal? On the right side. Yep, you got it. So it's abnormally thin on the left side. So this is a patient that had a compromise of the retinal vasculature. This is an old BRAO. This is not acute. This is what they look like after all the swelling's gone and all that. And I've got some that are more acute coming up. Okay, Kelly. So don't look at the foveal, uh, the, the cystoid space right in the fovea, look at the green and red boxes. The red box is the more, <clears throat> the neither one's that obvious. These are not easy. The, we'll say the green block box is closer to normal, although it's not normal. The red box is not normal. What do you see that's different between those two? Uh, the green box um, has a thicker inner retinal yep. layers than the left Thicker. Box. And what else about those layers? <clears throat> And yes. Organized. Right. So they're disorganized over here in the red box. So we call that drill disorganization of the retinal inner layers. It's something you'll commonly see in diabetics. And if you see that, the closer you see it to the fovea, the worse their vision is going to be. We don't have a fix for that. Okay. And that's the same patient. And I love to put laser in like stadium seating style. All right. And that was in, in the OR. I don't do that in the clinic. In the clinic, it looks like crazy, you know, just wherever you can get laser take. All right. Uh, Abby, right? Yes. Okay, Abby, what do you see here? Um, yeah, towards the left side of the image, the inner retina is like more in focus for sure. Absolutely. So this is a patient, something similar. They, uh, they had non-perfusion. This is something you might see with sickle cell disease as well. This patient had Eels disease, um, but peripheral capilla retinal capillary non-perfusion. So fluid in the retina for David. Uh, what do you see here? Oh, yes. Good, good pickup. Yep. So these registers from top to bottom on the Heidelberg are about two millimeters. 
So anything that extends beyond that, you're going to see as a reflection or you're not going to see it at all. Um, so we see that reflected back. And you're right, there's fluid. Um, you have a very thin choroid as well. And we see a little bit of an ERM. Yeah, so right there in the center, um, yeah, so basically what you're seeing here is a distortion of the foveal contour, primarily due to ERM formation, but also due to this myopic traction maculopathy, this, you know, axial expansion, axial elongation. You know, I, I tell patients that, you know, parts of your eye can stretch more easily than other parts. The RPE does not stretch well. The retina stretches a little bit better, as we can see here, and the sclera stretches okay. Um, and so you could, if you look at the IR photo, you could see a lot of RPE atrophy, all that um, brighter signal there. Um, and so this patient, I, I wouldn't use the word break. I tend to save that for retinal tears, but, but you could definitely say discontinuity or something like that. Um, and it's not a full thickness macular hole. In fact, I wouldn't even call it a partial thickness. I would just call this sort of irregular, or you call it a, a verticalized foveal profile or something like that. Um, could you say schesis or no? Absolutely, schesis works. Yep, you got it. Uh, why do I? Oh, this is a different photo. Okay, here we go, Saxon. Um, so we have a little bit of an ER in here yep. with some central systoid fluid. You got it. Yep, and that's basically all there is on this one, ERM, post-phaco CME. Um, if you see, can you see my cursor right here? Yeah, I can see Just under, yeah, so you get the ellipsoid zone here, and then you get this little bump. And so when we talk about ERMs only, this one's ERM plus post phaco CME, that, that little cotton ball sign has a name. It's called the Sunoda sign, or, or some people call it cotton ball sign. But basically, we see that in some ERMs. It usually some compromise of the visual function. It's not a reason necessarily to operate. This is that patient's FA. You can see the leakage there. It might be the only FA we see today. Um, OK, Taylor, sorry to give you a reversed OCT, but what do you see? Definitely. Um, but it looks like overall the layers, I mean, even though there's fluid in the, in the retina, retina, it looks like all the layers are coming together. Um, the outer retina looks so, I mean, yeah. I it's just like artifacts. Yeah, I think you're seeing some artifacts, some shadowing. It does look a little bit attenuated in terms of lipsoid zone signal. I don't have a good answer for that. It is just fluid, and it's fluid due to a systemic medication the patient's on for cancer. It's Braxane. So okay. it's a microtubule inhibitor, I think. Um, okay, okay, Michelle, I put a star here because this is pretty close to pathognomonic, but don't feel bad if you don't know it. Um, or just describe what you see. Okay. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my attention is drawn to the, the retinal um, fluid. Yes. Mm -hmm. That's good. That's a good place to start. So the other thing I could ask you is, is this fluid pocket more circular or kind of flatter? Flat. Right. And so one term we use is scaphoid, which is a funny word for like boat or something like that. When you see fluid in the retina, you could think of it as being there as a, as a, a, a either being produced like fluid exudation, like a little fountain, a little spring. <laughs> Or it's there because there's tissue destruction or tissue loss, and the tissue around that space just kind of holding up that space, if, if that makes sense. And so when you, when you think of fluid production like a spring or something, the fluid's going to expand. The path of least resistance, if all else is equal in terms of the, the matrix or the structure that you're in, it's going to be fairly spheroidal. And in this case, we don't see a spherical or a circular um, spacing here, so you think about tissue destruction. And actually, there have been studies that look at these cases, and they analyze the, hyper, the reflectivity profile of the vitreous and these spaces, and they're virtually the same level of blackness. Whereas if you have an exudative leak, like a diabetic, those leak, leak spaces tend to be a bit more hyperreflective. Not hyperreflective relative to the retina, but not as hyporeflective as the vitreous. So this, is, and this is, so this is a left eye scan. You see the thicker NFL over on the left side, so it's the left eye horizontal. And then I'd have to kind of tw twist your arm a little bit here, but this is a little disruption in the lipsoid zone, which is typical for these. So this is a patient with IMT2, idiopathic macular telangiectasia type 2, and this is not the most obvious one. Um, when I was a fellow, when we saw these, we didn't, this was not pathognomonic. 
um, because we didn't have this level. This, these OCTs are just now being viewed. Uh, and oftentimes they would be, you would do the FA, you'd have them come back. And unless you saw crystals or right angle vessels or some RP hyperplasia, you weren't sure of the diagnosis. So nowadays the diagnosis can be made by OCT pretty quick uh, and is a very common thing that we see in clinic. Okay, and now we've got Lily. Uh, this isn't something you're gonna see every day in clinic, but go ahead and tell me what you see. Absolutely. Where is the fluid located? Which layers? If you want to guess. Yeah, it's a tough one. So the fluid in some places, hey, let's see if my cursor will show up here, is kind of in the outer nuclear layer. But then here, goodness, come on, cursor. I'm going to move it here and see if it catches up. It's in the internuclear layer. Again, those nuclear layers are typically darker. So we're seeing it mostly in the internuclear layer. I'll Put my cursor there. Yep, there it goes. So we're seeing fluid in the I and L, and this, when I was a resident, was not where the fluid was classically located. This has been a bit of a, a paradigm change as well because of the advent of OCT. So this is a patient with an X-linked condition. Anybody want to guess? Juvenile X-linked retinoschisis. So, uh, and this patient, I literally that morning went to Carl Regillo, one of my attendings, and said, do you have any patients with X-linked retinoschisis? I really want to see one. And he's like, wow, that's not something we see every day. And that day, this guy showed up in my clinic. Like, I'm not making this up. And so I was like, so excited. I was like, oh my God. I didn't even diagnose it at first. I was like, what is this so weird? What are these membranes? And then we figured it out. So um, this guy has the veils, uh, the vitreous, the, the ILM is splitting off and scrolling. You can see in that OCT, there's like this weird look, looks like a, a dead sunflower kind of a thing. That is like some scrolling up of membranes. So we know they're splitting at the NFL. That was a classic thing, right? But there's also fluid accumulation commonly in the INL, and I've gotten pushback from some people, but I think most people have now seen it's, it seems like it's most commonly in the INL. Okay, ooh, let's keep going. All right, we're gonna get, catch a few more. Uh, this is iatrogenic, okay, Kelly's up. That's your clue, iatrogenic. I didn't cause it, but one of my friends did. Uh, there's a large, circular, yep. singular area. Uh-huh, that's right. And it, as opposed to what, all that stuff I said about exudation and destruction, this is a third category. This is subretinal PFCL, and this is what I call PFCL BFFs because they will be together forever. And this is what it looks like on the photo. I promise I didn't do the surgery or cause the optic nerve atrophy. Okay, hopefully the patient's better off now. Anyway, fluid under the retina category. All right, we're up to Abby. Okay. Uh, fluid yep. Yeah, so what do you see above that fluid? I, yeah, I, I would describe it as really, really long outer segments of photoreceptors are hanging down. We used to call them like shaggy, we still do shaggy photoreceptors. Um, and that tells you that it's been there for a little while. If, it's, if the fluid's been there for a really long time, then you'll actually see those dissipate and the photoreceptors just don't make as many outer segments. We think we're getting kind of more into Daryl Baskin conjecture land, but this is kind of subacute. And this, you wanna guess what this might be? This would be like a young 40 year old, I say young, 40 year old male, old for you guys, old 40 year old male, under a lot of stress, he's a pilot. PFCL. Yeah, there we go. Uh, okay, David, this is a tough one. So just describe it. I wouldn't even be able to get this one. Um, I mean, there's just fluid in the outer retina, it looks like on the left. Great. Kind of between, like kind of in the lip -like zone, potentially kind of more outer. Image. Yeah, and you're interpreting a time domain OCT with the pseudo color. So man, good for you. So this showed up when I was a fellow. I never even got to see the patient. This is from a satellite office. And, and when you split the, uh, the outer, um, basically when you, when you have fluid that splits the photoreceptors from the nuclear layer, which is what's going on in the phobia, we call it a bacillary detachment. I should have a better, I have a better photo of this somewhere, but not of this guy, of another bacillary detachment. Um, I think coming up actually. Uh, so that, that has a, its own differential, which I haven't put together yet, but there's a few things that do cause that. This is the patient that had Coxsackie virus, acute idiopathic maculopathy. We won't spend a lot of time on this. This is a, a, a very rare scenario. Uh, and that's what it looked like on photograph. You see some hemorrhages there. You can see this fluid. It looks like there's just fluid under the retina. As we know now, there's some fluid under the retina. There's some in the retina. Okay, Saxon. All right, so we have um, kind of distortion of the normal foveal contour. Yep. With some intraretinal cysts, almost look like large vessels. Yep, um, good, good description. like a tacky colloid. Yeah, maybe so. Mm-hmm. Way to break out the term. Okay, so... 
Those little spaces are surrounded with a hyperreflective ring. <clears throat> They're fairly specific. I should have put my little asterisk here. We see them, and usually, I mean, the most common scenario, I see them in is dry AMD GA, right? Yeah, so this is. And some drusen, right. So these are called outer retinal tubulation. These are not blood vessels. These are like rosettes of photoreceptors, the photoreceptors that no longer have a home and an RPE. They're kind of like, well, let's get together and do our own thing. This is what they came up with. So don't treat this. This is not anti-VEGF responsive. These will not go away. These are signs of end-stage disease, unfortunately. Um, oh, wow, we saw this picture earlier today. All right, Taylor. Oh, yeah, this is the, so you see the subretinal fluid, the hyperreflective material. Uh-huh. Best disease. The best disease. I mean, this is not pathognomonic. You can have other things that can create this picture, but um, best disease is going to be one of the most common. And this is the photo. And we've got a few more minutes. Okay, so this is the other basilary detachment. Sorry, Michelle, gave it away. Um, <laughs> what is important is I'm going to show you. Oh, I already gave it away. So VKH, and I will say VKH has a very distinct appearance, uh, at least in the acute phase. When you see these kind of bolus detachments that are localized to the macula, they, it kind of almost looks like there's some uh, milky white stuff underneath them. I mean, this is an exudative detachment. I think I've got a better OCT coming up. Nope, I guess it's coming up later. Um, and this is not pathognomonic, but it's, you can't see how thick the choroid here is, but the choroid is very thick. Um, there's other things to think about, like sympathetic, um, posterior scleritis, but um, my brain always goes to VKH when I see this kind of photo. Okay. Uh, run out of time here. Lily, what do you see? That's right. There's a lot of disruption, yeah. So um, not a great scan. This is a peripheral OCT, and this is some residual fluid after a buckle. And you can see the pigmentation line there. And I'd like to say this wasn't my patient, but I actually don't remember. But I think the fluid did eventually go away. So happy ending for that patient. Uh, Kelly, hard to say what the cause is, but what do you see? See um, some subretinal fluid. That's exactly right. Hard to say beyond that what's going on because this is not a great one. This this is due to a nevus, and the only way you would know that is if you saw the picture here. Although I will say, if I had not done a pseudo color, we would have probably seen some evidence of the nevus. You can see nevi fairly well on OCT, um, just not that one. That one you could argue that there is some evidence of it there. Okay, and then Abby, what do we have? Yep. How about the RPE? Yeah, there's like the, there's some small PEDs, uh, and so what's at the top of your differential? Fluid, PE, small PEDs. You're in private practice in Fredericksburg. Uh, AMD. Yeah. So a little bit of shrimp. That's that kind of grayish stuff right there. Um, and that's the patient. Okay. And then let's see. I'm going to see how many, when we're going to get to the next section because there's a couple other important things to cover here. I don't even know what slide I'm on. Here we are. Okay, we'll just have to be a to be continued. All right, we'll continue on with here. This one I'm going to go through just because this is not super relevant. This is fluid in multiple layers. Um, this is a patient I saw with papillorenal syndrome, um, optic pit maculopathy, and um, but optic pit maculopathy is a very common cause. If you look at everybody has fluid at multiple layers, optic pit is something you should think about, especially if you see it next to the disc. This is a patient with subretinal fluid due to acute retinal necrosis, so that does happen. Uh, it's an exudative RD. It was really hard to see clinically. In fact, I'd say you probably couldn't see it clinically. He actually did well. Um, young guy, 20 years old, uh, going into college. Choroid 2 fat, pachychoroidopathy, as Saxon mentioned. Um, so here we go. Here's a nevus. So you can see that there, that little homogenous, hyperreflective material kind of underneath, or underneath, not kind of. And then that's a melanotic choroidal nevus. And it's not, um, and actually this one I actually asked uh, Dr. Shields about, this is when I was attending at Wilford Hall, you know, is there any chance that she had a history of, I think, breast cancer? And then, and then we found this, and we weren't sure. She hadn't had it documented before. 
And I was like, do we do a big workup for metastatic disease? And if I recall correctly, she said, because you can see choroidal vessels through this, makes it much less likely to be a metastatic lesion. Metastatic lesions usually are a little bit more opaque and you can't see through. I followed her too and nothing changed. So, um, and there it wasn't multiple, right? It was just one. So this is that, I think it's a VKH patient again. So we see the thick choroid, lots of subretinal fluid. This is a different patient with VKH. All right. And yeah, there you go. It's good just to see these and have them in your mind because later on when you see it again, you might go, oh yeah, I, I kind of remember that. All right, so I'm showing you 511 on the choroidal thickness. There are certain diseases that give this the most common one. You'll probably see a central serous. This is another this is another cause of pachychoroid. Um, anybody, or I'll just tell you since we're running out of time. So the RPE is really irregular. So um, I and and kind of elevated a little bit. And you could see if you look at the blood vessels, they're also a little bit irregular. This is a patient who just had glaucoma surgery, and their pressure's like two. Yep, you got it. And I've caused it. When I was in Africa, I did a lot of traps, and I did not do them as well as I'd like. So I used to make fun of people that did cause hypotony maculopathy, and now I'm in that group. So now I don't make fun of people with that. And, that, and they usually, as long as you can you know, get their pressure back within, we, we say six weeks, but hopefully sooner, then usually there's no major untoward effects in the long term. Uh, I want to end on a good note. What is this? Oh, this is that same patient, hypotony result. Corey, too skinny. This is a myopic patient with a staphyloma. Uh, this is a, a patient with AMD, thin cord as well. Most patients with AMD are gonna have a thin cord unless they have like PCV or something like that. Um, this is a patient with commotio. So you see loss of the normal laminations. This patient, I, this patient I think made a pretty good recovery, but they can have a permanent RPE changes out or segment changes as well. Um, yeah, there you see the commotio and Subretinal, subretinal drusenoid deposits or reticular pseudodrusen, very important, unfortunately, very poor prognosis, visually speaking. Doesn't confer risk for CNV, but confers risk for GA and loss of vision. Um, okay, and this is really low yield, but this is a MUDES lesion. Um, and we're, this is RPE metaplasia in IMT2. I wouldn't expect anybody to know that. If you saw the picture, that might look, you see the crystals, there's a whole crystal and retinopathy thing, but if uh, differential, but if you see that kind of pigment hyperplasia, crystals like that, that OCT diagnosis is sealed. You don't need a second opinion. And we're gonna finish the RPE covering something up. Uh, this is a patient with pattern dystrophy. This is a patient with ocular histoplasmosis with the lesion right in the fovea. Didn't actually have CMV here, but was symptomatic, which is unfortunate. Um, and this is an RPE rip with subretinal fluid. This is what it, the OCT was like before the rip. And, oh, I think we do have something else. Oh, this is good. You guys should know this. Anybody recognize, know a drug that would cause something like this? This is not induced by a drug, but a drug can cause, create this picture. Yeah, plaquenil chloroquine. This patient actually has cone dystrophy. The, the, the retina looks too young to be plaquenil because this is like a, a 15 or 16 year old. Um, it's cone dystrophy, she has some optic dystrusin. Um, oh, here we go. Here's the Plaquenil one. A little bit older looking retina. This is a patient that got off of Plaquenil, then got on chloroquine, didn't come back to retina, and they got on Pla It was a really bad story. I inherited her, and this is how she looked. Um, and she was 2040 to 2050 range. It still had some progressive atrophy even after we had her stop. Um, that's her OCT. And GA, oh, no, sorry, this is choroideremia. This is my one and only choroideremia patient. If you ever see a choroideremia photo, it's the same guy. Real nice guy. Probably not alive anymore. Um, and then this is, oh, this is a good one. So this is on a differential for a bullseye maculopathy. So we've talked about chloroquine. We've talked about cone. Anybody know anything else that could be on the bullseye maculopathy list? I would show you a picture, but I bet it's going to say the diagnosis. Uh, it's Stargardt's. Yep, there's a picture. Good. So some flex. Okay. All right, let's finish. That's GA, finally. Uh, this is the other eye of the patient with GA. Okay. Oh, I do need to show you this. RP, this is really good. See the peripheral retina here? It's not technically peripheral. It's like the periphobial or the near periphery. You see the loss of lipsoid zone, and the ELM comes down and touches the RPE. This is not pathognomonic, but... Um, a lot of patients will complain of some visual changes and you'll look inside their eye and you won't see anything. If you get this OCT, you know it's real, okay? RP is something, this one's a more obvious one. That's, you got vascular attenuation, waxy pallor, et cetera. Okay, oh good, and this is what we'll finish on. Okay, this guy came into me, referred from a cataract clinic at, at Wills, 
and they're like, we don't know what's going on with you. He has a macular hole. So I look in, and I'm like, oh, yes, this is really interesting. And so this, I said, I looked at the guy. I forgot the exact question I asked. I asked him about, um, I asked him about oh, is peyote. Because at the time, the classic story was, oh, they, people take peyote, and then they stare at the sun. And he denied peyote, but he said, stare at the sun? Oh, yeah, I did that a lot. And so sure enough, he's got solar retinopathy. This is the guy that has better than expected vision. He's, he's got like this gap tooth kind of thing going on with his lipsoids, and I think he's 2040. Yeah, I might write in his vision here in a second. Nope. Okay, so that's it. We'll finish there. Let me. Um, Does he have a reason for staring at the sun, or is he just like? You know, so because... I'll tell you, he came in and he had, um, I think it was around Palm Sunday, and he had some palm leaves wrapped around his head like like kind of a caesar kind of a crown going on and the more we talked the more you could see why he might have chosen to stare at the sun i mean he was just a very unusual person um really nice guy though and fortunately still could read you know and the guy had good enough vision to like get a driver's license in some states so uh let's see my family again and then oh wait here we go references all right let me go back over here. So in case anybody wants to see the references, this includes some things we didn't get to. We still haven't gotten to ICGA or fundus autofluorescence, which we we're going to try to do in the summer. Uh, maybe I'll try to pack that in uh, next week. We'll see. So any questions? I know you guys, your, your troopers, you made it through. Everybody's still awake. Count that as a congratulations to myself. Thank you all. And we'll end there. The basilary is Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Oh yeah, you you bet, military guys uh, and girls. Uh, the basilary. So it's a new thing. They just. It's not in the BCSC, or if it is, it's in uveitis. So the basilary detachment is basically fluid accumulation within the photoreceptor layers. So you're seeing it usually in the outer nuclear layer. I used to really poo-poo it and think that's not real, but I've seen enough OCTs where it really looks like it splits the photoreceptors in half. The outer segments are still stuck. You still see an ellipsoid zone. You still see the RPE. And then you kind of see this like whole thing going around, like you could see the, the, the whole delineation of it there. And then you still see the um, outer nuclear layer, maybe in the ELM. And, and it, there, is, there is probably a differential for it. I haven't made one up myself. We've seen it with BKH here and Coxsackie virus. You would think of it as an inflammatory process affecting the outer retina. More than that, I'd be hesitant to kind of give you anything. You know, I always worry about what I say, you guys might remember more than you should. Right? I mean, I'm making an offhand comment, and this happens to me now. I make an offhand comment, five or ten years later, resident comes and says, I remember when you told me this, I'm like, oh, that doesn't sound like a good thing. I should not have said that. So always take it with a grain of salt, even if you think the person you're listening to is respectable. So it's always good to double check. Trust but verify, Reagan said. Okay, thanks, everybody.